uh, we're going to have a different little bit of a different show. My name is John O'Grady, and I'm the president of the Franklin County Board of Commissioners. We started these online conversations in April to provide residents uh, with some direct information uh, that center around the aid available during the pandemic, safety tips, and other useful information. You think these are chats that are important because the numbers keep getting worse by the day. We've gone uh, from the first, the state's first coronavirus case being discovered March 9th in Ohio to more to almost 145,000 cases and over 4,700 deaths statewide now. Uh, and the, as a nation, we've lost more than 201,000 people. Franklin County had one of the highest numbers of cases and deaths in the state. And though we have uh, been doing better lately, if you look at the rates, which uh, is the number of cases per 100,000, uh, we are no longer in the top 10. However, we still have had uh, over, um, over 26,500 cases uh, and 606 deaths in the state of Ohio. Unemployment rates have reached more than 1.5 million during this pandemic, which is more than Ohio saw in 2017, 18, and 19 combined. Today, my guests are uh, the Franklin County uh, Auditor, Michael Cinziano, and Kay Persinger, who is the Director of the Franklin County Dog, and, uh, Dog Shelter and Adoption Center. Uh, if you're uh, new to this series or if you're, what, or you're a frequent guest, you can submit your questions uh, via Facebook in the comments section. We'll try to answer them as we go along. So don't be bashful. Um, so we have, uh, we have, we'll have plenty of questions. I have questions that are already um, uh, <clears throat> part of uh, what we've put together for the show today. But we always like to take questions from the audience. So uh, let's start with Kay. Uh, Kay. Why don't you talk to us about the shelter and what you guys do there? Um, give us a general overview of all that the shelter does, um, but also, if you can, uh, give us um, some information about uh, dangerous dogs and why, um, you know, just all, all that you guys do there. Talk to us about everything. Good afternoon, Commissioner O'Grady. Sasha's here to help me this morning. And by the way, she's seven and available for rescue or adoption. She's a sweetheart. I just need to note that she does not do well, do well with other pets, which is why she's on our our rescue list as well. You know, she's struggling right. a bit with all the other dogs in here. So she's right. going to help me with this interview for a little bit. Um, you know, we exist by the Ohio Revised Code, and our mm -hmm. primary reason for existence is to prevent the spread of rabies. That's why animals were... Um, mandate across the nation. And we work closely with the auditor's office and the health department to ensure our dogs um, all receive their rabies vaccines and are property licensed. However, in Franklin County, we're extremely blessed with commissioners that understand the need um, to give the best care possible to stray dogs even when they find their way into our shelter. What the most important thing is to try and get them reunited with their family. But while they're here, you know, I could talk for days about everything we do. We definitely don't have enough time to cover everything, but we have a full veterinarian staff um, that's contracted with a nonprofit to do all of our vet care, which includes not just spay and neuter, but they'll do other outpatient operations and surgeries just to improve the quality of health and to ensure whoever adopts these guys is getting the healthiest dog possible so they can all live their best life. Um, we have a foster program, obviously an adoption program. We work closely with rescue organizations. We have a food pantry and we offer spay and neuter services low cost. And there are different times throughout the year that we have low cost microchipping. While the dogs are in our care, um, every single person, including all the volunteers are certified fear free. Cause we know when these dogs come in, they're a little fearful. It's kind of a scary place, you know? So we try and make them relaxed and as comfortable as possible so that we can see what truly what their personalities are and let them shine. And we do so many enrichment activities. Again, I could talk all day about that. Yeah, my dog came from, from you guys and she's still a little skittish. Uh, she doesn't even like to go to the vet. As I tell them every time we, we take her there, we either take her there to get um, you know some sort of uh, medical service or we take her there to be, to be boarded when we go on vacation or whatever. And, Nothing good ever happens to her there, I think. And so she's just, she's just always skittish when she goes there. 
we were just up at the uh, shelter a couple of weeks ago. We took, uh, we brought you guys a crate that uh, we almost never used when we first got her. Uh, so it was very gently used. And we also brought in, I know you were doing um, a, uh, uh, um, uh, not a, a, you were doing a, a, trying to get some, get folks to donate uh, uh, dog food uh, for your program there so that you can uh, donate out dog food for folks that are in need to be able to feed their pets. And so we brought in, we brought in some dog food as well. Great staff. They, they uh, were very helpful and, and uh, very, uh, very busy uh, when we were in there. So good job. Uh, Mr. Auditor, how are you, Mr. Stinzi? I don't know. Uh, you're on mute, I believe. Can, can we hear you now? You there, Mike? Oh, can't hear you. You look muted. Uh, I can't hear you. <laughs> no, I can't hear you. Oh, it, you keep flashing back and forth between red, but for some reason I can't hear you. Nope. Still unable. Oh, I think Mike's going to call back in. In the meantime, I believe I have a question here from the caller while Mike's trying to get back online. Um, we have a question, Joe, uh, Kay, about the foster program um, from April Worley. So I don't have the question in front of me. Jody, I think, is going to send it to us. So, uh, Kay, do you want to talk about the foster program while we're waiting for the question? Sure. Um, as you're aware, Commissioner, we started a holiday sleepover program here, here in 2016, which was extremely successful for the community and for our pups here. And... Um, I have Sammy with me now. <laughs> Sammy, Sammy had a little handful. He's got a lot of energy here. And Sammy's available for adoption today if anybody wants to come and visit with him. Anyway, um, yeah, the foster program, when COVID first struck, we decided that we would implement the same policies we had in place with sleepover, understanding there were going to be a lot of people off of work and maybe had the time, you know, to help us care for one of these little guys or even... Um, help them care for themselves. You know, we know that pets can be instrumental and in, in people who may be suffering anxiety or depression because dogs just want love. They want to give it and have it. So um, since we opened that up, it has been extremely successful. You know, thanks to the community, over half of our dogs have been able to, I think I'm going to let her run around a little bit. <laughs> She's pretty excited. Um, yeah. Over half of our dogs have been able to be placed in homes and later return for adoption or they've outright adopted them. I am happy to say this week, um, we did post for a formal foster coordinator, a full-time position that is a full-time job. And once that person's in place, we're going to have um, a little better and a little more often communication with our foster families. You know, we're working on some training videos that we can forward people for special needs and special trainings with some of our dogs, but I'm really um, happy with what we have so far and it's only going to continue to get better and grow. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that. Mike, can we, uh, are you back? Not, still, still don't have any, any okay. audio. From yeah. Okay. Juan, are you working with them to see if we can get Okay. Well, I think Juan we'll work with Mike to see if he can get him some audio there, and in the meantime, we'll we'll move on with Kay while we're anxiously waiting to hear about the auditor's office. Uh, the auditor and the and the um, uh, uh, the shelter work together on dog licensing, and and so we're going to get into that here in a minute. Um, Kay, how is the uh, 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 how has COVID adopted or, or affected adoptions? You know, um, the co since COVID's come, we are one, probably one of the fewest, one of the rarest to really um, see the positive out of COVID. You know, I understand that, you know, it's taken many lives and that we're not making light of that at all. But with people being home from work, they, adoptions have actually gone up. Obviously our foster program 
Um, it's been a little struggle with the volunteers because we can't have them in here like we did before, but they've been so helpful in scheduling time so that we're not overcrowded and still, you know, maintaining our social distance and things. So that's fantastic. So if I'm not mistaken, I mean, not only are adoptions up, um, but it's at, at different points you guys have had, I mean, very, very few dogs actually available for adoption because adoptions have been so up, correct? Yes, since the beginning of COVID, it's rare to see more than 50 dogs available for adoption at any given time. We have some still in stray weight hoping to find their families, but um, normally it's anywhere between 15 and 20 dogs is what we have available on a daily basis. Yeah, that's great. Um, <clears throat> what type of, uh, and Mike, I think we're still having some technical issues with you. I, um, I switched, <laughs> oh. so hopefully you should be able to hear me now. I'm on a, a member of the office's phone. Oh, there you go. He's back. I got you. That's great. All right. So, I apologize. Kay, we're going to come back to you, Kay, um, here in a few minutes. Let's talk about, Mike, so give an overview of, of, of your office. Talk about what uh, the auditor does uh, universally. I, tell us all about your office. Well, thank you, Commissioner, for the opportunity to join. And always good to uh, be with a strong partner by ours with the shelter and Kay. Uh, so the County Auditor's Office has four primary functions. You heard a little bit about the dog licensing and the partnership with the shelter. Uh, we also serve as the county's chief weight and measure office, uh, most uh, and best well known as the stickers on the gas stations. Uh, we have the jurisdiction outside the city of Columbus. They have their own weights and measures division. Uh, we serve as the county's chief fiscal uh, office and function as well as the chief property appraiser. And it's that property appraiser piece that is our uh, most important role, given how uh, the appraisal process is correlated to property taxes and how we fund a whole bunch of services uh, in municipalities and governments across the county. Great. Um, all right, so let's, uh, let's get, um, we got, we're gonna come back to the auditor in a minute. Let's get back to the shelter for a few minutes here. Um, so Kay, what type of, uh, what, what type of common problems do you do you guys uh, see with the dogs that end up at the shelter? Dental problems, um, how uh, how that's linked to health issues, dogs uh, dogs that don't have licenses, um, and what makes it difficult to get dogs back to their owners, uh, things of that nature. Well, Sophie here is going to help me explain that. And Sophie is seven years old, and she'll be available for adoption here in the next few days. She gets along with other dogs, but she's super timid and shy, and it really takes her a while to warm up. Um, and one of the things, especially with these little dogs like Sophie, we see them come in with a lot of dental problems. And the dental problems, you know, cause them just like us to get super cranky. Um, they're not able to eat a healthy diet. Therefore, they end up with digestive issues. Um, another common thing is obviously people that for whatever reason can no longer take their dogs and we don't judge them because they know that we're going to do everything we can to get them in a great home. Um, but we also see a lot of dogs that come in that can't be potty trained. Um, at least the owners believe that. And a prime example, we had a little dog like Sophie here come in the other day. The owner said she'd been working with the dog for over two years and just could not handle it anymore. And we did, had our veterinarians do a physical exam and come to find out she had gallstones. Um, once we got those out, she was perfectly able to be potty trained. So it's just so vital. We have dogs that come in here with parvo, um, especially puppies and all these things. They're very, very costly to treat. You know, it's not always a death sentence for the dog, but it's extensive. It's hard on the dog. Um, and all the preventative vaccines can really help that. Um, one of the things that's mandated, like we talked about earlier, is the rabies vaccine. And not only is it important because it's the law, but if your dog happens to break the skin of a human being, your dog has to be quarantined whether it's had its rabies or not. But if it's had a rabies shot, we're more likely to let you quarantine that dog in your home because chances of that dog having rabies is gonna be extremely low. And so we just give you some information, notify the health department, let you do it at home. If the dog has not had any vaccines, unfortunately, we've got to bring them in this strange, cold sometimes to them environment and um, isolate them from pretty much everyone and everything for a minimum of 10 days. Now, if they've been in a scuffle or in contact with wildlife just um, recently before that skin was broke, whether it's a bite, a scratch or whatever, 
we've got to do it for like 30 days. So it's really, really important to get your animals vaccinated for rabies. You know, a lot of people believe that it does, it's not a problem. Well, the reason we don't see it is because people are actively vaccinating. But unfortunately, rabies is alive and well, and it is pretty much a death sentence um, should an, a person or an animal um, come down with that virus. So a popular program that you were talking about earlier <clears throat> was the holiday sleepovers. Uh, ex ex expound on that a little bit. Explain a little bit about them. And will will they? You are you expecting that they're going to go on again this year? They are. We are. It's going to look a little different because obviously we cannot have the crowds in here. Um, and depending on the weather, we we're predicting it's going to be cold. <laughs> but we're not predicting a lot of snow or ice right now. And if that happens, we'll change it. But we'd like to have some stations set up outside. We can at least have 10 people to a station where we've got, you know, four or five dogs available to take home for the holidays, just to, you know, give them some time out of the shelter. And the best thing for us, not only is getting these guys in a home, but doing the report card and telling us what their likes and dislikes are, how they behave in the home, because the chances for a successful adoption after that goes, it just skyrockets. Gotcha. All right. Um, so question comes. We have some questions coming in from the audience. Um, so we have a question. Uh, what, uh, um, who designates uh, a dog when a dog becomes uh, dangerous and what goes into making that decision? If it's a dangerous dog, the person that does, well, the rules that go behind that are the Ohio Revised Code. There's some things that have to be met as written in the Ohio Revised Code. And you know we don't make the laws, we're just here to enforce them. That's so right. once those have been met, a dog can be designated as dangerous or vicious in some cases. Now, whomever owns the dog or if a rescue wants to come in and take a dog from us, they can always appeal that decision or go to court and let a judge hear it. And um, the law sets a $100 bond that they have to pay to the court to schedule a hearing date to see if that designation will remain. If no bond is posted, then it's just designated and whomever takes possession of the dog will need to follow all the Ohio revised code laws. Gotcha. So the legislature sets, sets the, yes. the, uh, the, the rules. Gotcha. Um, and so one of the things that uh, I know you've been working on um, that's been delayed by COVID is, is foster program. Uh, can you tell us a bit about uh, that and where it stands? We are fostering now. We went ahead and started um, the program a little informally in March because we knew we had to do something with COVID. Um, and we didn't want our numbers to keep skyrocketing because people weren't able to come here. And we knew that it would be helpful if people who are now at home all day um, could have some attention of one of our little dogs. So it has been extremely successful, even more successful than the holiday sleepovers. So we've incorporated that as our foster program, and we're just going to continue to formalize that and get it better and better as we go. And we are, thank you to the commissioners, have allotted us a position for a full-time foster coordinator that's really going to help with outreach and the families that are fostering for us. So we can still Great. find that. Great. Um, so I'm getting, I have a couple other questions here real quick, and then I want to get over to uh, the auditor. Um, so, uh, and I think this is part of the thing we were talking about earlier, what services are available through the shelter for low income families? We do have, um, our low income spay and neuter program where they can call down here, go online and make an appointment so that we can get their dog spayed or neutered. So they're not out there procreating and, you know, coming in our, then our shelter doors. There are times we have free vaccina vaccination clinic, rabies clinics, but those are at various times during the year. And we try to get that information out. But one of our most popular things is the food pantry. You know, we don't ask any questions. You do not have to prove income. And we know that there are a lot of people out there that will take care of their dogs before themselves. We don't want that to happen. We want their owners and their families to be healthy and happy. And we want to make sure the dogs and cats, we, are, we actually take cat food as well. And we just give that to people as they need it. And that's all ran by donations. Gotcha. Great. Um, so I have a question from uh, Tina Harlow for you. And then we're going to move over to the auditor here real quick. Uh, Tina Harlow wants to know if you are actively looking to add more rescue organizations to help spread out the need. 
We do. We welcome anyone. We have what's called the New Hope Program, and that just outlines participation into the program. You know, we want to make sure that um, our rescues are held accountable and that we're held accountable and that our, we understand what the rescues are going to go uh, through with these dogs and make sure they're getting the proper care because rescues, you know, when they pull the dogs, these dogs need special needs and some of them cost a lot of money. So we just need to make sure that the capacity of care that they have warrants them pull, continuing to pull dogs from us. And it outlines what we're gonna do for you as well, because we don't want you just pulling dogs and then not having outsourced for them. We wanna help you get fosters and adoption forever homes for them. So any 501c3 rescue that would like to participate, and it doesn't matter where you are in the United States, you can go online and read our New Hope program and take a look at that. And we would more than, than welcome you. Great. All right, Mr. Auditor, um, uh, you, you guys are the uh, ones who issue the dog licenses. Uh, how often do you need, uh, do I need to get, on, uh, or anybody, a resident of Franklin County or resident of the state of Ohio, how often do we need to get dog licenses? Um, and uh, is this required of all dogs? So under Ohio law, it is required that all dogs have a license. Uh, we have three different kinds of licenses you can get under Ohio law, a one year, a three year, or an annual or a permanent. So if you get a permanent, you do it once, uh, you pay a little bit more, uh, but then you're done. Uh, if it's the annual, you would apply during the December to March 31st window in Franklin County. Uh, given the great partnership with county commissioners, you helped us extend uh, that dog licensing window before penalties uh, would jump in. And so uh, required under Ohio law, that's what we remind folks. It is the law and encourage people to do it annually at a minimum. But if uh, they would like, in my household, we have three-year licenses and then other people take advantage of the permanent option as well. So I got you. And I, and I, you know, we opted for the three-year. Uh, it's nice. Um, it's nice to not have to remember to come to your office every year like I used to. So uh, the three-year one uh, was was a good option. Very so, stressful time in our household when my wife said, but where's our renewal? <laughs> also in partnership with commissioners, we'll be updating the website so people will get to know a little easier if they've got an annual three-year or permanent licensure as well. Yeah, we have another dog changeover. Um, <laughs> what's the risk if I don't get my dog license? So the risk, uh, as, as Kay alluded to a little bit, is not being able to get the dog back to the owner as quickly as possible. We're also under uh, Franklin County, you require the rabies uh, vaccination. And so there's a health component as well. Uh, so not being in violation of the law, as well as that health and safety component uh, are the primary drivers for why it's so important to have your canine license. Good. Um, so I got a question here. I was getting ready to get into, uh, um, you know, new. So you got, we have a new, we have a, Franklin County's got a, an influx of new residents. Uh, do they need to get a, a license um, if they're registered somewhere else? And then I want to move into like re stuff with you. So if the dog is licensed in an annual and they license another county and move here, that license is still good for that f uh, throughout the remainder of that year. If it's similar, three-year or permanent, uh, we absolutely recognize the license from the other counties. Gotcha. All right, so um, let's let's go into reassessments here because, and, and I have a question. <laughs> I have a question from a from a viewer from you uh, for you. Uh, so we're going to change topics real quick on you. Um, a couple a couple big initiatives are underway in your office right now that we just we just worked with you on these issues. Um, let's first talk about home reassessment. What is, what, what's a home reassessment all about? Um, and what is, what does that mean for, for homeowners? And, and it's, it's timely here because, uh, Connie McKee wants to uh, ask a question of you about that as well. Great. So under Ohio law, every six years, uh, county auditors conduct a mass, uh, appraisal process where we go out. So in Franklin County's case, go out, look at our 450,000 parcels, uh, in person. Then in the three-year uh, middle of those six-year cycles, we do a triennial update. It is a mid-cycle update looking at recent real estate sales. So what we're doing in 2020 is our triennial update looking at the real estate sales of our community in 17, 18, and 19 years. Uh, we are in the tentative value, so something not required 
uh, in law is once we notify folks, we hold an informal process where property owners can work with our office to establish what they feel that right value is. Is it too high? Is it too low? Are there features of their property that we may not have a proper reflection of? We don't go into uh, properties uh, inside the homes, so it's all done external. And so that's where that additional information and engagement from property owners is so important. And then by December, then we will uh, come back with our final values. If a property owner is satisfied with their tentative value, that will carry forward as the final value for those that are taking advantage of the informal process. Uh, we will notify them in December of what the final determination will be. So is that when the new levels will take effect? They'll or take effect on January 1st of January. 2020. Yep. January. Okay. So Connie McKee wants to know um, if it's there's any possibility that they can be delayed since so many people are suffering during COVID. So the office, Frank County Auditor's office, requested a one-year extension uh, to the Department of Taxation uh, earlier uh, before summer, and that request was denied. So we cannot, uh, we, we, we sought that delay, it was denied, and so we have to move forward. Uh, what resident owners and property owners can do though, we have our normal board of revision process. So anyone that has concerns about the values uh, they can petition through the Board of Revision, uh, and we can then work through them on what their options are. And that will take place January 1st through March of 2021. Thank you. Good, good, good. I, thank you for that. Um, all right, let's move back to uh, uh, the shelter here. Um, so... Um, Kay has, who's our new, who's our new guest, Kay? Our new guest is Gus, and Gus is six and a half years old, and he has some wheat and terrier in him, so he's got a definitely a sweet little personality, but Gus is blind, so I don't think he knows it, though. He, he gets along as if he's not, but he is definitely blind, um, and he's available for rescue or um, for a direct adoption as long as whoever is going to take him into their home understands some of the challenges they're going to have um, owning a blind dog. Gotcha. Um, so, Kay, Mary O'Connor Shaver wants to know uh, what keeps shelter pets up at night that volunteers in the public could help, um, or shelter employees, I'm sorry, what keeps shelter employees up at night uh, that volunteers in the public could help with? And she also says, uh, thank you to all of us for doing this. Mary O'Connor Shaver is a wonderful, uh, she's been a wonderful advocate uh, of, of all of us for the last number of years. So, uh, but what, what keeps the, the shelter folks, the, the employees in the shelter up at night that, that uh, uh, volunteers and other folks could be helpful with, right, during these times? The most important thing is that we have all these dogs and a lot of them, it's obvious they came from loving homes. And the fact they're not microchipped or they are and that microchip information is not updated um, and we just cannot find their owners, that's really troubling for us. The other thing is when we have dogs, um, mostly behavioral dogs that don't get along with other dogs, no matter what we do, we do a lot. <laughs> we walk them, put them in play group. We have several enrichment activities to help with the overall well-being of the dog. But just the sight, the smell, and the sound um, of other dogs really make their anxiety level through the roof. And all of our employees and volunteers get so attached to these dogs. It's really, really difficult when rescues don't have the resources to take them. And they're not, you know, ones that are easily to adopt because most people you know, have more than one pet at home or they enjoy going to dog parks and those sorts of things. And with those special needs dogs, it's really hard. So I think that if you were an advocate of socializing our dogs while they're puppies, you know, with other people and other dogs and just pointing people towards all the resources there are out there to make sure that you and your, your dog are living a happy life that will keep them out of the shelter to begin with. I, th I think that's the best thing people could do for us. Yeah. I appreciate that. So, you know, okay, here's, let's, let's get to, you know, maybe something that's, you know, not maybe, but definitely something that's always on our minds as, as commissioners and, and you as the shelter director, you know, we have, we have on any given, at any given time, we have hundreds of dogs and throughout the course of the year, we have thousands of dogs that come through the shelter and, and it is often uh, more often than we, than we care uh, to, to, um, to, you know, that we like to think about that, you know, there are dogs that, that simply, um, uh, you know, are either too sick uh, or that are dangerous or for whatever reason, there are 
many times that there are dogs that just can't be helped um, and they have to be put down. You know, so how often does something like this happen and under what circumstances do things like this happen? Let's let's just put that out there and talk about it a little bit. Yeah, you know, sometimes it happens on a daily basis, sometimes weekly. You know, we, we don't predict it um, and we deal with every dog as an individual. You know, our live release rate is something around 94%, which is really good, but there's still those percentage that didn't leave the shelter alive. And that really bothers all of us. It's never an easy decision. Um, but one of the things if a dog bites, we don't know the history of the dog or breaks skin, we need to send that dog off for rabies testing. And most of the time when that happens in the shelter, it's a dog that's um, already had some behavioral problems. And again, you know, the health and welfare of the rest of the community, we, we have to take that under consideration. Uh, we do everything we can. We try and give them every opportunity. But one of the most difficult uh, calls is when we have a dog that we call a psychologically suffering. You know, and I've been questioned about that a lot. How can I tell? We don't interview these dogs. And you're absolutely right. But when they're panting um, profusely and they have so much saliva covering them, you can't touch them because they're wet. And we are so blessed um, with the money to support a veterinarian staff that recognizes that. And we will give them anxiety medications. We have thunder jackets. We can put them in rooms by themselves, quiet rooms um, when they're available and it still doesn't work. You know, we have to look and consider a dog's psychological suffering. It would be inhumane not to do that, you know, and it pains us and we do put them out for rescue and we understand how hard it is to find a home just to care for those dogs. And a lot of times those dogs have been surrendered to us because People can't even crate them. You know, they've eaten through their crates. We had a dog that tried to eat through the bars here, actually broke the door of the bar and broke three of their teeth um, in the middle of the night because they just could not handle being locked up um, in, the, in the cages here. So it's tough, you know, and sometimes they come in with multiple injuries from cars um, or maybe they're at an age where surgery isn't something that's, that's gonna have a good outcome either. So putting them through the entire surgery um, just to have them you know, pass away isn't a good thing either when we don't think their age or their health could withstand the anesthesia. And we always, no one person, I think people often misunderstand, no one person makes that decision by themselves. Not even me. Right. Um, myself, an assistant director, we have um, the behavioral team and the veterinarian staff. And even after a dog is euthanized, we still sit down and do a debrief. Was there anything we could have done to change the outcome? Was there anything we could have done differently? And if so, we make sure we implement that to prevent it from happening in the future. But unfortunately, there's not. And although some people may disagree that, it, that humane euthanasia is um, the best thing for some dogs, you know, I guess there's times we're just gonna have to agree to disagree but it doesn't mean we enjoy doing it or we look forward to it because in no way do we. All right. Um, so we'll come back to, um, come back to this. Uh, I'm, I, <laughs> uh, okay. So I'm getting some questions. I'm not quite certain. I need some clarification on, cause I'm not quite certain uh, um, what they're asking. Now, Ann Daft has asked a question or has pointed out that Lorraine County commissioners uh, have shelter dogs uh, come to every weekly meeting um, and wants to know why we don't do the same. We used to do that. Yes. Uh, it's it's uh, I think in Lorraine County, uh, it may be a little um, maybe a little more convenient um, when when uh, bringing uh, bringing the dogs down to the courthouse downtown, uh, bringing them. It's it's I think it's a uh, Lorraine County is a little bit less uh urban than Franklin County is. And so, uh, Kay, I think you remember, we used to bring the dogs in uh, just about every week, if not every other week, we would bring dogs in, have them on TV, uh, do with the best we could to try to promote and get dogs adopted as often as we possibly could. Um, but it became a, a big uh, to do, uh, very difficult on your staff, very difficult on the dogs. Um, and so uh, we, uh, we ended that after a while, we did it for quite a bit of time. Um, we ended it after a while because it just became too much. We thought too much on you and your staff, uh, to have to bring dogs down, uh, every, every week to do that. Um, I don't, I don't think we would mind, uh, having it done on a, on a semi-regular basis, something that we could work out, uh, to, um, through Eric Janice, 
guys uh, that would, if it's not too much for you guys to have to do that or too much for the dogs uh, to bring them in and promote them. We don't have, uh, we're not having in-person meetings right now. We would have to certainly post pandemic, uh, but we don't want to, you know, we don't want to make it a difficulty. And at the time, I think it was becoming a difficulty for uh, Susan Smith and some of the folks on, on staff at the time uh, because of uh, coming downtown, parking, finding parking, parking a car, getting in, bringing the dogs in. It just became a big, it's, it's a much different thing in downtown Columbus than it is in downtown Lorraine. So right. anyway, let's, think, let's go back. I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kay. I, I think one of the other reasons was we found out that, you know, I think that once we go back to whatever the new normal looks like meeting in, in person, um, I think it's a great idea to do it on occasion, but we would definitely have to post beforehand because there were a lot of people who were allergic or very afraid of dogs that were either um, in the building working or people visiting the building. And that became presented somewhat of a challenge for us as well. Gotcha. Um, all right, so let's move back to the uh, county auditor. Uh, this is, um, uh, the, the dogs are kind of taking over the show here and I don't wanna- I don't wanna- That happened. We, we always appreciated the partnership. We've done a couple of our activities with the dogs and they do take over. Uh, and I was yeah. glad to see Kay had one that had some eyesight problems. One of our dogs uh, has some eyesight problems. So we know those challenges. Uh, and then, unfor not unfortunately, but the dog gets to adjust to a five and a seven-year-old at the same time in our household. But uh, they're fairly resilient. And, and as Kay pointed out, they don't really even seem to know themselves. Uh, so that's yeah. great. Well, with four kids in my house, uh, adjusting to a five and a seven-year-old is a tough thing for anybody. I well, for the COVID in particular, the dogs were used to having pretty quiet days, and all of a sudden they found themselves with the kids home uh, for many, many months, and so that was an adjustment. My dog cannot wait for the pandemic to be over so that everybody will get out of her house. Uh, That's how it feels. Sure. That's how it feels. Yeah. So, Mike, another uh, this is another big thing going on in your office, uh, and something that you guys have been doing is this uh, ballot level estimate. Uh, can you explain uh, what this is to the residents and what they can expect to see from it? So it ties in really well with what we're doing on the triennial, the Know Your uh, Value, your 2020homevalue.org uh, campaign. So that's the setting of the value. Uh, that gets then tied to your taxing district. And so what's really important that people know the value of their vote is how we frame it. Uh, what is going to be on your ballot, if it's a bond or a levy, and the impact of setting that taxing district rate will be with those uh, tentative values or ultimately final values. And that's how we get to the property tax. And so we put out uh, the office, a ballot levy estimator. You can also go to the website uh, and look up and put in uh, your address, find out what's on your ballot and then the impact it could have uh, on your property taxes, if it's gonna increase or how it kind of comes all together. Uh, one of the biggest questions we get with the triennial uh, property values as well as it's going to increase or decrease my taxes. And unfortunately, we don't know because it's going to be up to the voter and what gets approved on the November ballots. Uh, so that's one of the big challenges. Uh, we don't set those taxing districts. We help administer it, but it's the voters who ultimately set it. So knowing what's on your ballot, uh, knowing that value that an impact it could have, uh, that's really important. So that's why we make that service available. Gotcha. So, you know, obviously for anybody um just about anybody except for the professionals in your office and, and you know certain tax attorneys and others property taxes can be a confusing thing um does this assessment mean there will be uh, higher tax bills next year so there's no guarantee what the tax bill and i don't want to be cool and kind of avoid the question what we encourage residents to do is go to the year 2020 homevalue.org website uh, we do uh, and have strived to make it as easy to explain uh, how taxes work under the state of Ohio. Uh, when people see, so in my case, we had a 31% value increase. That's good news. Uh, that's a good investment for our household. That does not mean your property taxes, or in my case, my property taxes go up 31%. Uh, it's a portion, and then there's some other factors that get weighed into it, and then ultimately tied to the taxing district. What a lot of residents don't remember, though, was during the primary, uh, Franklin County approved a new bond issue. More dogs, Commissioner. <laughs> We're listening. Don't have any dogs in the office with me today. Um, but when we approved the Columbus State bond issue, that is a new uh, assessment as part of our property taxes. So having that added on 
is likely going to mean everyone is going to have an increase, but it was something that was voted on in the primary, has not been part of the uh, factors in the past. And so we wanna to continue to remind people, these are the areas that are being now assessed. So if it's the zoo, if it's Metro parks, if it's your local school district, that is all comes in combination and factored in with your property value. And with the, the, the voters approving the Columbus state levy last year, uh, nobody should assume that their that their profit that their bill their bill is going to stay the same next year, correct? Correct, and, and that's what we've seen, and, and why it's really hard to kind of give a definitive answer. We've seen people's values go up, property tax go down, value go down, and property tax actually go up. It's really what's in that specific taxing district, and, and we have many of those across the county. So, if a resident objects to their assessment, what can they do? So at this point, if they're not happy, uh, they've got about a little over a week to work with our office on the informal review process. We had to pivot because of the pandemic and health concerns. And so are encouraging residents and their schedule and their availability uh, to go and schedule a virtual informal hearing. They'll meet with an appraiser and share where they think uh, the value is again, too high or too low. Uh, if they prefer an in-person meeting, we also have three remote uh, locations, one in Hilliard, one at the Urban League in Central City, and one in Reynoldsburg, uh, where we also have appraisal staff available to meet, share those documents. Uh, based on what is shared with those values, we will go back, work with the Department of Taxation, uh, and again, establish that final value in December. If the residents, the property owners still aren't happy with those final values in December, then that would carry over and we would work with them through the Board of Revision process in January of 2021. Gotcha. So um, how do you address uh, redlining and avoid problems from years gone by? So one thing that really came up in the last couple of years are residents concerned about uh, the history of the city and how our community has uh, developed over time. Uh, when you put a highway in between two neighborhoods, the impact that has in uh, what property values and assessments have been. So when we came in, uh, in March of 2019, uh, one of our first actions was a performance audit to really dig in on how the mass appraisal in 2017 took into account or didn't uh, some of those factors. And, and what we saw from the performance audit was there was more work that needed to be done. Uh, we built from there and just this week had a great round table virtual uh, with the Kerwin Institute to kind of talk about the history of our community and how over time this has kind of occurred and where you've got similar properties in terms of lot size and features, uh, but they aren't being graded the same, uh, what role redlining had in that. Ultimately, we'll go back to another performance audit, see how we did during the triennial, but really building towards the next mass appraisal where we can really make that biggest uh, difference for property owners to make sure we're capturing the right values. Gotcha. Bourbon Ahmed says, thank you, Auditor Stenziano, you're the best. <laughs> yeah. tell my wife <laughs> yeah no doubt so Nala my dog she jumped down she uh she's off to chase more squirrels that's her favorite thing in the world to do she never catches them but she chases them an awful lot so um so let's get back to um uh we've got a few other uh things to to talk about here um so um so Kay uh there's um, there's several folks asking questions about um, having a behavioralist on on uh, staff at the uh, shelter, uh, somebody that can um, maybe help improve the bad habits of dogs. That guy right there, I think he's eaten a half a pound of treats out of your hands since she since he sat down. Who's that? This is Clove, and Clove is three and a half, and he's on our shy dog program. I don't know if he's as shy as he was scared. <laughs> he's definitely treat motivated, but he's. Yeah. He's going That's to be a pretty cool, but he's a sweetheart. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, currently we do have a lot of staff members, um, including our supervisor that we just newly promoted that's going to be over our return to home team um, and also in, in charge of play group and doing some of these assessments that have degrees in animal science. Um, and in addition to that, you know, we are certified. Everybody here is certified fear free. And um, we have a couple of staff members that are currently going through the Karen Pryor uh, Dog Training Academy that our commissioners and our county supports and, and is paying for that training to be beneficial. And we'd like to do some train the trainer. Uh, we also have a, a volunteer trainer that we reach out to. Um, she doesn't like coming here and doing it just 
because of the environment, it's sometimes it's really hard. So she'll sign a dog out as a foster. Um, and so we take care of all the expenses for her, but she does a training for free. And if we can rehabilitate the dog or learn more about it, then we do that as well. We also have just started um, about two months ago doing a training here um, after hours with members of the public who may have dog reactive dogs. There's Unfortunately, there's only a few we can get in here at a time because of space, COVID, and because they're reactive to other dogs. Um, and that is a pilot program that we have done now. I think we've done about six of those. They have been extremely successful. So we know how important that is. And we welcome anybody that has, um, training or especially if they're certified and trained the trainer, we would definitely like all of our staff to at least learn the basics in it. So, cause everyone touches the lives of these dogs at some point in their stay here. Gotcha. So Amy Speakman wants to know how people can reach out to the new fostering officer. Well, as soon as we get them hired and on board, we're going to be sending out on through social media and our website, introducing that person. We don't know who it's going to be yet. You know, right now we've got several hands in the pot just trying to manage the fosters that we have now. But um, we'll definitely have uh, an email, a phone number and ways they can reach back. And if COVID weren't here, we may even be able to do it virtually where we can introduce that person and, and talk about the position and take questions and, and ideas and comments. Sure, sure. All right. So um, uh, we are, um, we're still receiving questions coming in. So Mike, um, how long have you been auditor now? About 18 months. So you're just, you know, just walking in there. You've got your feet wet. You found the bathroom. You know where everything is. You've been around the county. I know you've had more town halls than, than you can shake a stick at. I mean, Mike Cinziano came into office and, and hit the ground running. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, you know, you've, you've, uh, you've done a fantastic job of doing all the research, doing all the, uh, you know, uh, un uncovering every, um, uh, everything uh, that you could possibly do. You know, you've, you've taken a look at under the hood of the entire auditor's office. Um, you know, you've done a, done a great job of, you know, you brought in a great staff, top notch, top notch folks. Um, and, and, you know, it's just been a breath of fresh air to see the way that you've, uh, you've, uh, approached this, this position. Um, what is the, um, I think I got a question what, what is, um, uh, what, what, what is the most, uh, 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 amazing, I guess, shocking thing that you found or amazing thing. I don't want to, it's not shocking necessarily, but what's, what, what do you, what do you find about the job that, that you didn't expect? when you became auditor. I, I did not expect our weights and measures team to go out and measure the scales of high school wrestling, uh, but that is a function of the auditor's office. I, I, we understood or I knew there was a lot of depth and breadth uh, of the functions of the office, how much it impacts uh, directly into people's pocketbooks uh, is a role that we take serious and continue to strive for. Um, the office has, you know, as you mentioned, talented staff and, and the great opportunity to mix some new thoughts and, and new ideas with uh, a lot of seasoned employees uh, that really have been able to get things in a good spot, but then how do we advance it? How do we take it to the 21st century? How do we make the office more accessible, uh, transparent, uh, and available? Uh, and it's tough to do when you're on floors 19 and 21. Uh, so that's why we're really excited. Once we're able to get back out there, we've got the mobile office, we'll be able to perform a uh, majority of the functions, and then just the overall relationship with the county engineer, uh, the treasurer, Cheryl Bookcell, and county recorder, uh, Danny O'Connor, how important all of our offices are to perform various functions for the uh, folks that really engage with our offices on a daily basis. I'll tell you what, you know, as a former wrestler, uh, <laughs> I will tell you, it, it's, it seems kind of odd, you know, to I'm sure to the everyday person out there that you would uh, it would be so important to certify the, 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 the scale for a, a high school wrestler. But, you know, uh, they didn't do that back when I was wrestling 125 years ago. But, but they, they, they need to now because, it, you know, these kids, these kids cut a lot of weight. And parents, you know, get pretty, uh, get pretty scared about the amount of weight some of these kids lose and how they lose it. Um, and, and kids have, over the years, kids have, 
kids have suffered because of uh, the way they've lost the weight, the amount of weight they have lost. Um, you know, back when I was in school, uh, we used to we used to go have our body fat tested at Ohio State by by the way, oh by the way, by Dr. Strauss, um, uh, who's been in the, who's who's obviously been in the news quite a bit over the last couple of years. Um, and he used to come to our school to test our weight because kids were losing so much weight uh, on these really good wrestling teams, which I was a part of. Okay, we're going to get back to that dog here in a second. Risky guy that he is. Um, but kids were losing so much weight to, to on these really good teams. The kids have to lose so much weight just to be able to make the team because there weren't places for them uh, uh, because there were, the competition was so good. They would have to lose an incredible amount of weight because – somebody in their weight class on their own team was better than they were. And so parents were getting concerned and getting worried that they were cutting too much weight. Um, and so, yeah, it makes a lot of sense that, uh, that the county auditor would come bring their weights and measures team in to, to certify the scales to make sure that. I can anticipate a lot of emails. The email from that wrestling coach was, was a pleasant surprise. And yeah. got out there and got the scales and measured for him. There you go. Well, good. Good. Well, anyway, uh, you guys are doing a great job, and we appreciate Thank uh, you. I and I appreciate uh, uh, Berman Ahmed uh, thanking you for the work you're doing and, and chiming in. Okay, who was that big? Uh, that big I got, I yeah. heard up here again. He has some mastiff in him, obviously. His name is Dino. Come here, Dino. Come on. Come on. Come on. His name is Dino. And Dino is a really fine example of why rescues are so important to us. He has severe dog aggression. He does not like other dogs. And you can see how he's got some muscle on him. He's a pretty strong guy. Um, so he can pull us around here. He also has severe separation anxiety. He, he's not doing well in the kennel um, environment, although he's doing really good with me pretty much here. You know, he's a, he's a lover. Um, but when he's not around people, and, and unfortunately we can't be around him 24 seven because we have other dogs just like him. We do try to bring him up here in administration and give some, some attention and alone time for him. But um, if, if somebody just had, you know, a good place for him to run and, and be alone and get all the love you had, he's, he'd make a great pet. But we just feel that um, a rescue, a great organ, a rescue organization would be best to take him as soon as possible. Yeah, I hear you. My first dog that we had from you guys, but that I got, we had for nine years. Um, she loved other dogs. They just didn't love her. Uh, oh. does, that, does that make sense? I think I talked to you about her back at the time. I know I talked to your predecessor about her. We had a dog that we got from the shelter way back when 2000, not 2010, maybe. Um, and she, uh, she absolutely loved other dogs, wanted to play with every dog that she found. Uh, they just were not a fan of hers and uh, she um, she would go try to play with all these dogs and as soon as she started playing with them they didn't like uh, playing with her too much and so uh, but we uh, we had her for nine years she was a fantastic dog kid kids loved her she was a lover of human beings that's for sure and uh, she was a great dog with us for nine years but uh, now we have Nala and Nala is Daphne was a big dog I was a little dog and uh you know so we'll see uh we look you know I brought I brought my wife up to the shelter a couple of weeks ago and and if, if I'd have stayed any longer I'd have been I'd have come home with another dog but you know <laughs> my wife was trying to drag me out of there as quickly as she could so um so what uh, before we get closing here let's uh let's let you guys have you know some some final words so Mike what um what would you like to uh leave uh, our guests with um before we close up for the for the afternoon what uh what thoughts would you like to to leave everybody with about the auditor's office about your relationship with with uh the the shelter about your relationship with the commissioners whatever what are your what are your thoughts well want to of course remind folks now is the time uh to go out look at their property values and if they've got questions concerns want to participate in the informal let us know uh, that window is closing uh, just over a, a week from now. Uh, then generally, as always, I am accessible. Feel free to give me a call on my cell, 614-219-9224. Email the office, Auditor Stenziano at franklincountyohio.gov. Uh, from consumer protection to licensing, uh, we're here to serve you. And so if there's any questions or areas uh, that you may not be in that dog licensing window, uh, really has helped show uh, driving up those numbers. I know Kay and the shelter appreciate 
uh, that ongoing collaboration. Uh, and so thank you all for the partnership. Great. And Kay, uh, I'm actually going to give you the last question that just came in and I'll let you close out by telling, ask, letting folks uh, in on whatever you'd like to. Um, but several uh, folks have texted or, or, or uh, questioned in on, on Facebook asking why uh, shelters um, needed to sign a new hope agreement. You know, I think before there was nothing in place. If you had a 501c3 and anybody that knows anything about nonprofit, that's just for tax information. So we really need to do our due diligence to make sure that the people that are pulling these dogs as rescues have a plan in place. You know, we, we try not to be entirely faith-based. And also there's certain expectations they are going to want of us. And we want to make sure we don't fall through, you know, any loopholes there as well. So it's not a contract. It's just an agreement, you know, that we're going to do our due diligence and we expect them to do the same. And we're here for them. Um, we want it to be a, a great, fantastic partnership, but having something just entirely faith-based just did not make sense to me. Gotcha. So are there any closing comment things that you'd like to, to add? I will keep it short, but there's a lot. <laughs> Thank you so much for inviting me, inviting us, and uh, for having the auditor here too. You know, it's always a pleasure to talk with my commissioners and thank you guys uh, for your generosity and supporting the shelter. There's no way on earth we could do what we do just licensing revenues alone. No way. So um, <laughs> every person counts. So if you have not done your census, please do it. It counts, it helps, it helps with revenue. It helps us here at the shelter. Um, sure. And the advocates, um, I thank them. You know, sometimes uh, they're extremely passionate dog lovers. I appreciate that. I really do. I know that they sometimes don't understand the dynamics here. And some of the decisions that have to be made out of here aren't easy. They're difficult. And I know none of them want to sit here and make those decisions. And I respect them for that. I respect their opinion, opinions and, and I value their thoughts. Um, I just hope that we can continue to work as adults and, you know, treat everyone with respect because we're all here to serve the greater good and every resident every day. Great. Thank you, Kay. So I have one final question for both of you, and I do this not all the time, but sometimes when we close out here. So before we go, during this time of pandemic, I'm a big supporter of local foods. So uh, each of you, give me, give me your... Uh, what have, you been, what have you been doing during, uh, during the pandemic? Uh, what, uh, what local restaurants uh, have you guys been supporting with takeout? So, uh, uh, Mr. Auditor, have you been supporting a particular so local restaurant? Our family has taken to the Lion's Cub cookie delivery. Uh, we we uh, should have invested in it because of the amount of cookies we get. We also really enjoyed uh, Columbus Food Adventures Trust Ball. Uh, oh, program, yeah. And it's been fantastic. We've done Columbus Food Adventures Trust Fall more than a few times, that's for sure. If you haven't okay. done Lions Club and they deliver, you should take advantage of that. Lions Club, I'm writing that down. Lions Club cookie what? I missed that. Were you still with us, Mike? I am. Lions Club cookie what? It's just Lions Cub and they do, uh, they Lions will Cub. deliver. Yes, they've done pop-ups at North Market, but they also will deliver uh, okay. if you're in their delivery area. All right, because you know, I got cookie freaks here in the house. I'm not much of a sweets guy, but my my wife and kids will love that idea. All right, they're, they're doing a brown maple and bacon cookie as their feature cookie this week, so it's not just chocolate chip. There you go, there you go. Okay, what about you? You know, it's interesting. I am a big fan of Mozart's. I'm really close here to the shelter. Love them. But before the pandemic, I I'm not a cook. I don't cook. Um, great at pouring out dog food, but I am not a cook. So they had my business all the time. So since the pandemic, I've actually learned how to cook a little bit, you know, taking some recipes down and had some patience um, on some days I've had to work from home and able to like actually cook me a lunch. And it's been quite enlightening. I can't say I'm a cook yet, but I'm, I'm trying it. <laughs> well, good for you. Good for you. My, my 21 year old down at the University of Cincinnati has been cooking up a storm. He couldn't boil water before. Uh, before the last couple of years down in Cincinnati, he's slowly become a cook, but he's this last semester, he's just going crazy. He's really doing well. So good for you. Keep it up. Um, you know, anybody who knows me knows I'm a foodie, knows I'm a, I'm a former restaurant owner. I'm a, you know, but I also like to support, I, and I, I cook here all the time. 
um, but I, uh, I like to support the local restaurants and, and um, I have a lot of friends in the restaurant business and I've had a lot of them on this Facebook live over the last several months. And, and um, uh, matter of fact, uh, tonight, uh, I don't know about the rest of my family, but I have already committed to my, my sister-in-law that I'm coming over and she's got uh, in her subdivision, she can, she uh, um, is in charge of, of bringing food trucks uh, every couple of weeks. And tonight is the main lobster truck. And so I am having be a lot good. of fish for dinner tonight <laughs> uh, because that's, that's who she has. And I'm not passing up that opportunity. Uh, I don't I know think, if they're coming with me. TV program. What's that? I think they were on a TV program. Yes, yes, they were. So that's what I'm having for dinner tonight. I guess whether my the rest of my family is having it or not, maybe they can get some pizza or something if they're not coming. But that's what I'm having. But anyway, support, support your local restaurants, whoever it is, and thanks for you guys. Uh, 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 and yeah, if you haven't tried the Columbus Food Adventures Trust Fall, it's fantastic. Look it up online. Um, we have enjoyed that for sure. Uh, my wife and I have done the Columbus Food Adventures uh, ourselves in person a couple times pre-pandemic. Uh, have you done that before, Mike? I did not. My wife has, though. Oh, it's a great thing. Uh, it's too much to explain it tonight uh, or today on here because we'll run out of time. But uh, look it up online. Columbus Food Adventures. But Theo Wolf and her husband do a fantastic job. We've done the brunch tour and the all eats tour, and it's it, you'll enjoy it if you get a chance. All right, so let's close out. Um, in closing, I'm Commissioner O'Grady, John O'Grady. I'm the um, and you can find all this information that we talked about today uh, on our website, commissioners.franklincountyohio.gov. Um, you can also, uh, uh, for the shelter uh, and adoption center, go to dogs.franklincountyohio.gov or the auditor's website, which is uh, www.franklincountyauditor.com. Uh, we will continue hosting these commissioners' conversations, so keep watching for details. Uh, by the way, uh, Commissioner Boyce is every Wednesday afternoon at 3 o'clock, and I'm every Thursday afternoon at 3 o'clock, uh, so keep watching for details. We always post the information on our social media channels, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Nextdoor. Of course, uh, we want to reach as many of our residents as possible, so if you're talking to friends and neighbors, uh, tell them to be... Uh, we will be streaming conversations like these on a regular basis and posting them to YouTube. Until next time, I'm John O'Grady, president of the Franklin County Commissioners, uh, Franklin County Auditor Michael Stinziano, and Kay Pershing, director of the Franklin County uh, Dog Shelter and Adoption Center, uh, and saying thank you for joining us. Thank you, guys. Uh, we hope uh, that this was useful for everybody. And remember, uh, we are all in this together. Thanks, guys. I appreciate you being with us today.